Good evening and welcome to New Milton Baptist Church for our evening service. We meet to worship God. Hear some words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling, to the, the, reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favour I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favour. Today is the day of salvation. And may God bless his word to us tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together to worship you, to worship you, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We come together in the name of Jesus to bring you our worship, to honour you not just with our lips, but with our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our very selves. We come to worship you through Jesus. Jesus, God made flesh. Jesus, who knew no sin, yet was made to be sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God, that we might become your children. For through him we are made righteous. Through him, through faith in him, our sins are washed away, and we're born of your spirit to know you, to love you, and to serve you. And Father, we come with such gratitude to worship you. And we ask, Father, that as we come, so we might perceive your, your presence, so that we might hear you speaking to us through your word in the prayers as we sit quietly before you, that we might be challenged and changed encouraged and renewed in him. So Father, let this be our act of worship as we offer ourselves back to you. Yet even in saying that we recognise that we do hold back, that we aren't perfect, that we, we have sinned in thought, in word and in action. And so we come confessing our sins confessing because we cannot cloak anything from you, nor would we. Confessing because we know that you forgive. And as we confess, so we depend upon your promise that you forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So receive our worship this evening, we pray in and through that precious name of Jesus, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. And in the evenings we're looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And the reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4, and I shall be reading from verse 7 through to 16. 
a reading from verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by what by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for that word, that word which is truly spirit and life. And we ask, Father, that just as the spirit breathed it out when Paul wrote it, so we ask that you'd breathe it into our hearts tonight. Father, we ask that by your spirit, you would enable me to speak and open up your word. And by your same spirit, Lord, that you would interpret those words and work conviction, encouragement and correction in our lives. Father, we, we, we place ourselves into your hands. Come, Holy Spirit. And we ask this through Jesus. Amen. Well, verse 7 begins with the, the words, To each one grace has been given. To each and every one who believes, grace has been given. And this is the heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That even though humanity has estranged itself from God, choosing to go its own way, cutting itself off from its creator, choosing sin, choosing self-determination and disobedience, severing the relationship with God that we were made for. Even though the human race has estranged itself from God, such is his love that he seeks reconciliation with us. Ever since the fall, ever since our first ancestors chose to go their own way, God has been reaching out to human beings through Moses, through his Old Testament people, the nation of Israel, through the prophets, and ultimately through Jesus. In him, God was made, made human. In him, God made the ultimate appeal to us. Jesus is his ultimate declaration of love. We have estranged ourselves from him, but in Jesus, God bridged the chasm that we opened. Our sin estranged us, so in Jesus, God dealt with it. Fully God and fully man, perfect in every way, Jesus died on the cross, surrendering himself to human cruelty in all its savagery making himself the atoning sacrifice for our sins. His death has brought about the possibility of our forgiveness. His death has purchased grace for us. Grace, God's loving kindness that we do not deserve. The way to reconciliation with him. And for each and every one who accepts God's offer of reconciliation, to each and every one who believes, grace is given. Grace is lavished upon us. And it isn't for just a few. 
To each one grace has been given. All are invited. And to each and every one who believes, grace has been given. God's loving kindness, his acceptance, his mercy, his love has all been lavished upon us. So much so that each and every one who turns to Jesus, each and every one who believes, is not only reconciled to God, the moment anyone comes to believe, something truly amazing happens. The moment we believe, the moment that that wonderful grace is given, we become a new creation. The old has gone. The past is wiped out. Sin is forgiven and a new start begins. The power of God courses through us. We're made new. As we heard in this morning service, we became part of God's own family, beloved and cherished. The old has gone, the new has come. God's family on earth is the church, not the institutions, but the gathering of God's people, people coming together as his own. And as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 in our first reading, God has committed to his people, to the church, to us, the message of reconciliation. In Jesus, God was reconciling humanity to himself. He longs for all to return to him. And through Jesus, he's made that reconciliation possible. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He died for us. He was buried. On Easter Sunday, he was raised to life. And 40 days later, he ascended, he returned to God the Father. And in committing to us the message of reconciliation, he gave us the means to deliver it. When he ascended on high, he gave gifts to his people. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. To each and every one who believes, grace has been given. Each and every one who believes has been given the Holy Spirit. We are each a new creation, born of the Spirit of God. There are no classes of Christians, for to each one grace has been given. Each and every one who believes has the Spirit. Each and every one is beloved, born again and equipped by Jesus equipped through the Spirit to each play our part for spreading that message of reconciliation. The message has been committed to the church, committed to us, and we each have a part to play. To each one, grace has been given. And Jesus has placed a calling, a role to play, a job to do in the life of the church to each one of us in the fulfilling of his ministry of reconciliation. We each have a job to do. God desires that we each come to maturity so that we are each effective, so that we are each in him the best that we can be. And to that end, in verse 11, Paul tells us that Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ, the church, may be built up. It is Jesus himself who gave, Jesus himself who called, and each of the offices that Paul names here are necessary to the existence, to the life and the growth of the church. It's Jesus himself who gave. But in this case, it isn't just the roles that were given. It isn't just the equipping that was provided. It's Jesus himself 
who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. In this case, it's the people who fulfill these roads, these roles, who are the gifts to the church. God has equipped them. To each of us, grace has been given. To each of us, God has given a particular gift. You can see the gifts lifted in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12. An easy way to remember it. God has equipped each of the offices, each of the roles listed. But it's actually the individuals who are the gifts to the church. It is Christ himself who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Each of the people equipped and called to fulfill these callings are gifts to the church. And their job is to equip his people, to equip the rest of the church for works of service so that the church, the body of Christ, may be built up. So that God's message of reconciliation can be spread. The purpose of the church is to make disciples of all nations. To, to speak out, to bring that message of reconciliation to all who will listen. It's our job to ensure that all get to hear that all may be invited to believe and be reconciled to God. So let's take a look at these callings and see how they're a gift to the church. Well, the first one, as we heard, is apostle. And this is certainly the controversial one out of this list. He gave some to be apostles. Well, the word apostle means one who is sent. And the original apostles were the twelve, those out of Jesus' disciples who he specifically designated as apostles. And the purpose of an apostle is set out for us in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, in choosing someone to fulfil the role of Judas, the betrayer who had committed suicide, Luke records the words of Peter. And in Acts chapter 1, Peter says, Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who has been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of those must become a witness to the resurrection. The qualification for an apostle was to have been one of Jesus' disciples from the beginning one who had seen the ministry of John the Baptist, one who had heard the teaching of Jesus, one who had seen the miracles, and most importantly, one who had been a witness to the resurrection. The function of, a part of an apostle was to be one of the foundations of the church. And just as the foundations of a building give shape to the building, just as they create a stable platform on which to build. So the apostles gave shape to the church. We see how in Acts chapter six, because as the church grew, the apostles could no longer do everything. The job was too big. So they decided to appoint those that we would now call deacons, those who serve to do the practical tasks. In Acts chapter six, we read that the Twelve said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among yourselves who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The role of an apostle was to give shape to the church through the ministry of the word. They had been Jesus' direct disciples, they knew his teaching, and they taught the word. 
They interpreted and explained it. They wrote the New Testament for us, writing under the control of God, the Holy Spirit. The Gospels and Acts are their recollections. They were the direct witnesses. In the early church, that there were apostles other than the Twelve. But again, the qualification was that they were witnesses to the resurrection. Now Paul, he was an apostle, but he didn't become a Christian until some time after the events described in the Gospels. But his qualification to be an apostle was accredited by the fact that he encountered the risen Christ on the Damascus Road. In 1 Corinthians 9, when he defends his apostleship, he writes, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Well, the role of an apostle is to give shape to the church, to be a witness to the reality, to the truth of the resurrection. And clearly that generation has long since died out. Being a Christian is all about knowing Jesus. But there's no one alive who was with him when he walked the earth. There's no one alive who was a physical witness to the resurrection first hand. So I would suggest to you that the role of an apostle in that sense has ceased with them. Their teaching is there for us in the New Testament, giving shape to the church today. But no one living now was alive when Jesus walked the earth. There are those who do perform the role of giving shape to the church. Missionaries and, and church planters who lay foundations, and to some extent, Pastors and teachers teach the word and give shape to the churches under their care. But I would suggest to you that the original designation of an apostle was a once only thing. But the apostles were certainly a gift to the church. Second, we have prophets. Jesus gave some to be prophets. Now the word prophet means one who tells forth and prophets tell forth the will of God. They don't foretell, they don't tell the future, they forth tell. And there are those even today who still forth tell the will of God. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul writes about the gift of prophecy and he writes it in such a way that it's clear that this is something that should still happen. They don't, prophets do not supersede or challenge scripture. They speak it into specific circumstances. There are people who possess this gift today. They speak prophetically, most often without realizing it. We've often heard people speaking directly like this and often in church meetings. And the best preaching is prophetic. When the word of God is truly preached, it's preached under the influence and in the power of the spirit. He speaks through the preacher directly into our lives. And the spirit, the author of the scriptures, will never contradict them. So if anyone preaches contrary to what is written, if anyone brings a prophecy contrary to what it says in the scriptures, then they're a false prophet. They're a servant of Satan and should be treat, treated as such. They should be ignored. We'll look at evangelists and pastors and teachers next week. But it's important to recognise that these people are gifts to the church. And as such, they should be recognised and their ministries accepted and responded to. So often people focus on the gifts, on the gifts they possess, and perhaps they wonder about them. 
They talk about them. But it would perhaps be more beneficial rather than to wonder about the gifts, but for us to focus on each of us being a gift to the church. If we realise that we are gifts to one another, then perhaps we will prize ourselves and one another even as Jesus does. The person that sits next to you in the seat is God's gift to you. The roles and the functions aren't the gifts. They're the equipment. It's the people who do them who are the gift. Jesus gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to equip his people, to equip them for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. These people were and are given to the church to equip us, to equip you for words of, works of service. And for them to be of any benefit to you or to me or to Jesus, we need to be serving. We need to be acting on their ministries, responding to the word, getting off our backsides and doing something about it. These people are gifts given by Jesus. But if a gift is ignored and not used, then it's of no benefit to anyone. So let's be sure that we're responding to the words of the apostles, because they're here in the New Testament. So for starters, let's make sure that we're reading them and putting them into practice. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these people who fulfill these roles, for their gifts to your church. We thank you for the apostles of old who laid the foundations through, through Jesus. We thank you for their writings in the New Testament. And Father, we thank you that they're not just human writings, that they're your very word, that your spirit breathed those words out and carried them along to write them. Father, we ask that you give us the grace to respond. We ask too that, Father, we, that, that we might, when we hear your word spoken prophetically, be it by someone in, the, in church or, or outside, or be it from the pulpit, when we hear your word spoken prophetically, that, Father, we would recognise it, that we would respond and that we might become good and faithful servants to Jesus. Father, we ask this in his precious name. Amen. And what else could I read but take my life and let it be? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite, would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. And if we give ourselves to God like that, then we make ourselves gifts to one another. Now we're going to bring our prayers for others. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the ministry of these different people amongst us, historically and today. And Father, we pray for all those who speak prophetically, whether from the pulpit 
or within the church, that Father, that they might speak the truth and that where the truth is heard, that people might respond to your word. Father, we do pray for your church throughout the United Kingdom, asking once again that you will revive it, that as this time of lockdown comes to an end, Father, that you will equip and prepare us to serve you and to, and to perform that ministry of reconciliation that you've committed to us. Father, we pray for all those in this time of lockdown who have been suffering domestic abuse. Father, we pray, first of all, for the perpetrators, that you'd bring them to repentance, that you'd open their eyes to their wickedness, and that you'd cause them to seek help that they might come to true repentance and come to kneel at the cross of Jesus. We pray for all those who have suffered, asking, Father, that you would find them safety, that you would find them relief. We pray for their families, and especially the children of those who abuse, that they might not, through what they've seen, become abusers themselves. Father, we pray for healing. We pray for mercy. We pray for our government. And Father, we pray for each MP, each government minister, and particularly for, Bo for Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister. Father, grant them wisdom. Grant them the ability to discern what's right, how to govern and lead this country through this crisis. And as this country is no longer quite so locked down. So Father, we pray against the spread of this virus, asking that it might burn itself out, that treatment and that, um, that vaccines be, be found so that it, it might be eradicated altogether. <coughs> Father, we pray for the, 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 this church here. And Father, we pray for wisdom for the leadership for wisdom to know when and how to open, how to interpret the new regulations, that we might see this church serve you and serve your ministry of reconciliation to the world, that through this church many might be reconciled to you. Father, equip us, enable us and use us, we pray. We pray for those known to us who are sick, those known to us who don't yet know you. Those who once walked with you and have fallen away. And Father, we lift them up to you in our minds, asking that you heal, restore and save. And finally, Father, we, we, we bring to you our own needs, trusting them to you knowing that, we're, that as you promised, that when we seek your kingdom first and your righteousness, that all that we'll, we need will be added to us. So Father, receive our thanks and our praise, we pray, in that precious name of Jesus. And as we bring our time together to a close, so we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now a blessing from Romans 15. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And God bless you.